to. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Fossil Friday Chats here in the dog days of summer. Uh, my name is Brittany Stoneberg from the Western Science Center. With me, as always, is my co-host, Gabriel Santos. What's up, everybody? <laughs> and here today, joining us is our good friend and a local Southern Californian, uh, Philip Bowen. How are you hey, doing, Hey, it's Philip? great to be here, guys. I'm doing great. Yeah. Uh, Oh, did, you, did you disconnect? Okay. No, we're good. A little technical issue and I could hear myself talking, but you know, that's fine. I like the sound <laughs> of my own voice. That's why I do the show. <laughs> yeah. So how's everybody doing this summer? Yeah, it it's is a little hot. toasty up in Riverside. It uh, it's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Out here in Rancho or Claremont, we're like, I have like two fans running just so to make sure like my computers <laughs> don't like overheat right now so i'm like this is gonna be, yeah. this gonna be fun it's gonna be great we do put them through their paces on fossil friday chats even when it's not summer. yeah but you know I, I like to say southern californians we really i think we appreciate the winter more than most people in the united states when you know when we're experiencing like 110 degree days like you know, we really appreciate those like 60 degree days. Mm -hmm. I, that's because like our winter is like people's spring and fall. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. For some people's summer, honestly, like the that's UP true. in Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Not to make fun of anybody else out there. So. No. Yeah. <laughs> so if you are if you're not familiar uh, familiar with Philip's work, uh, he is a second year PhD student at the University of California Riverside, who studying the spatial distribution Ediacaran fossils at Nilpena Ediacara National Park, South Australia. He received a Bachelor's of Science from the University of South Carolina and a Master's of Science from the University of California Riverside. Before starting graduate school, Philip worked for the South Carolina Geological Survey, where he did digital cartography and spatial analysis. And can I just say, <laughs> digital cartography sounds really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a uh, yeah, it's a sweet. We can talk about that uh, afterwards. It's, it's actually a really interesting uh, field. I've actually cool. never heard of that before, so I'm I'm going to start looking up questions while you're on your presentation. <laughs> so I'm like, this sounds interesting. Great, yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, so yeah. I guess. Yeah, and if uh, if anybody, as always, if anybody has any questions for Phil, go ahead and put those in the chat. It could be questions about fossils. Hell, now we know it could be questions about digital cartography. But go <laughs> ahead and put those in the chat, and we will do our best to get the uh, to get to as many as we can. So, Philip, whenever you are ready, uh, please go ahead and start your talk, which I will mention is probably one of my favorite talk titles we've ever had on Fossil Friday <laughs> Chats. It does delight me. Well, great. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, you're going to make me blush. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so um, so my talk today is going to be about probably some of the earliest animals that most people have heard of. Um, and there's this group of organisms, and they're going to be all soft-bodied, and it's at the very beginning of complex ecosystems. But before I get into that, I, I think I should just do a, a sort of introduce myself and explain how I got to the position I'm in. Um, so I'm originally from uh, this town in South Carolina called Simpsonville, but as you can see from this little map, I've kind of lived throughout the US. And one thing I just wanna tell you all is that, you know, scientists and paleontologists are, we're not just these brains that sit in an office all day and look at fossils. We're, we're believe it or not, normal people uh, and we have other hobbies and activities outside of our work. So like, I like to go rock climbing. I love to go running. Um, I'm a huge college football fan. So if you want to throw any college football questions in the chat too, I'll be happy to answer those. Um, and funny enough, my sister, who you can see here in the red, was actually the one growing up who wanted to be a paleontologist. And I wanted to be a lawyer. So I sort of, I missed my mark a little bit. Um, but I ended up becoming a geology uh, undergrad because... I accidentally took a geology for engineers course uh, to fulfill a science requirement and ended up loving it. And so I switched my major from history to geology and uh, I ended up uh, getting a bachelor's degree from South Carolina and then was hired right out of undergrad uh, to work for the South Carolina Geological Survey. Um, so any parents out there, uh, you know, geology is a great career. Um, and then I went off to graduate school and I got my master's uh, and now I've stuck around UCR to get a PhD. But you're probably thinking, 
wow, Phil, this is a lot of geology. I came here for fossils. Like, where's the fossils? Um, and that's because I literally stumbled um, on or into paleontology. My uh, my junior year of undergrad, we went to this place called the Little River Fossil Site, which is in uh, the Piedmont region of North Carolina. So right before you sort of hit the Appalachian Mountains. And um, this site had had been somewhat famous in the 70s for discovering the oldest animal life. Um, and they had dated it around 620 million years ago. And so we had gone there as just sort of a, a quick stop on our trip. And the, the professor had said, you know, sort of tongue in cheek, well, if anyone finds a fossil, they're getting A in the class, thinking that this site had been completely stripped um, years ago. And so, you know, there's some folks and they're talking about like, you know, the fossil side or whatever in the geology. And I have to admit, I wasn't paying terribly too much attention. I was sort of wandering around kind of down here and I, uh, I slip and I fall and everyone kind of, you know, is like, ah, Phil, haha, you know, he fell. And, you know, I'm just like, ah, man. And so I look to my right and there's a, a little imprint in the rock. And what ended up being was one of these, um, organisms called a Viaforma antiqua, which, um, which, like I said, uh, has this sort of turbulent history of initially being a, thought to be a worm, and then some people thought it was a trace fossil, and then people thought it was um, a type of pseudo fossil known as a tectograph, which is essentially an imprint caused by uh, by tectonic movement and folding. And so this project ended up uh, becoming my whole undergraduate uh, research thesis, and it involved me going to the Smithsonian Support Center in Washington D.C which it feels like um, the end of the first Indiana Jones movie, where it's just all these, you can see it in the back of this image, it's all these shells, just random stuff. Um, and across from me in this image is actually a, like a, an Olmec head, like a seven foot tall Olmec head. So just this crazy room. Um, but I, I made these really cool um, image compilations of the fossil bed and uh, basically, I looked into combining structural geology, which is essentially how how are different geologic layers um, folded and transformed via tectonics um, in relation to the paleontology. And so this project actually then led me to my master's and now my PhD work, which focuses on this time period known as, as the Ediacaran. Um, and so you know, what is the Ediacaran and what is geologic time in general, right? Um, as humans, we have a difficult time understanding, well, deep time, right? Um, our lifespans are at most 100 years and geologic time is massive on the scale of millions or billions of years. And so there's a long tradition of geologists and paleontologists scaling geologic time to various things. Um, so in my case, I decided to use Shrek <laughs> so uh, the base of geologic time, the formation of the Earth is going to be Shrek's feet. Um, the Earth, Earth was formed 4.5 billion years ago. Um, the first evidence of animal life, more or less, is 3.8 billion years ago. Um, and this is going to be very simple stuff, microscopic, um, single-celled, very few multicellular stuff, um, but all microscopic. Not until uh, 230 million, notice the change of scale now, we're at millions of years ago, do you have the first dinosaurs, more or less? Um, and then our species, Homo sapiens, don't show up until 0. Uh, 0.233 million years ago. Um, but the time period that I work on in this Ediacaran uh, is the Ediacaran period, and it's between 635 to 538 million years ago. So, I mean, this is still quite a bit of time ago, right? This is half over half a billion years. Um, and what I want you to notice is just the gap between, I guess, Shrek's mouth and his shin, right? So the first evidence of life and the beginning of macroscopic, so life that we can see with our, with our eyes, um, is massive, right? But understanding how we get from the very small to the very large is an important step in how evolution developed on our planet and also potentially other planets, Um so the organisms that lived in the Ediacaran are known as the Ediacara biota, right? And these are a group of soft-bodied, uh, for lack of a better word, weirdos, um, which lived in various different marine environments, ranging from shallow marine 
to deep, um, well below the photic zone, so well below the point where light passes um, through the water column. And um, they range from being these sort of fractal frond-like looking organisms to eight-armed things like Eo Andromeda to Parvancarina, which sort of looks like a T-bone steak or an anchor. Um, and these organisms are some of the first macroscopic, so organ uh, organisms that are large enough to see with the naked eye things in the fossil record. But you're probably wondering, it's like, well, why should I care about invertebrates in general, right? Like we're vertebrates. Like why should I care about like something that's not potentially related to us? And I take deep offense to that, but I'll explain why it's important. Um, so invertebrate paleontology is important because of the, how the fossil record is biased. So the majority of the fossil record comes from the shallow marine um, environments. So these are essentially everywhere between where the shoreline begins and let's say 200 meters underwater, more or less. It kind of varies depending on where in the world you are. Um, but this is an ideal location for fossil preservation and the majority of things come from there. And even in modern ecosystems, the vast majority of organisms living in the shallow marine environments are going to be invertebrates. And so by looking at invertebrates, we understand, uh, we, we can have a good idea of how, say, organisms have evolved over time, but also how environmental conditions have changed over time. And by looking at the Ediacrobiota, we're looking at sort of the first invertebrate communities. And in fact, these organisms are so simple um, that they don't have shells, right? So there's no hard parts, with the exception of very few members at the latest Ediacra, known as the Nama. We really don't have any skeletalization. Um, and these are all going to be very squishy things. So think like anemones or jellyfish. And we find Ediacra biota around the world. Um, like I said, I was working um, on my site in North Carolina. We have a couple of sites here in California and across the border in Nevada. Um, there's some in Mexico, Spain, Canada, South America. You name it, there's probably an Ediacra site nearby. Um, but the place I work at is way down here in the Australian outback um, at Nilpena Ediacra National Park. And before going any further, I'd really like to acknowledge that Nilpena lies within the Adna Mutna traditional lands. And in fact, the word Ediacra comes from the Adna Mutna word, which means uh, the place where the zebra finch emerges. So the word Ediacra is actually an Adna Mutna word. So all of you now know at least one Adna Mutna word, which is pretty sweet. Um, and so what you're going to notice uh, in this site is that we have these large pits, and it almost looks like we have tile floors lined up on the ground. And so what that is are actually excavated fossil beds. So the earth, much like Shrek, uh, has layers, right? Um, and so we call these different layers bedding planes. And what we do at Nilpena, which makes us somewhat unique from other paleontology that you might be familiar with, is that we excavate entire bedding planes, right? And we relocate them to these paddocks where the beds are reassembled and flipped. And the reason why they're flipped is because all of our specimens are soft bodied. And that means that we actually don't have like bones. Instead, we have casts and molds. So think if you had a quarter and you push that quarter into silly putty, what you would have in the silly putty is an outline of the quarter, but you couldn't take that quarter to Walmart and, you know, buy a stick of gum with it. Right. So that's what we essentially have at Nilpena. And the, in those, those uh, outlines, those casts and mold are preserved at the base of our beds. So all of this material is then flipped over. But it allows us to view organisms um, at large spatial scales and then view the organisms also in an ecological concept. And so we have a context, sorry, not concept. Um, and so at Nopina, we have roughly 40 beds ranging in size from 1 to 23 square meters. And we roughly have 300 square meters of Ediacaran seafloor preserved. And the level of preservation is so high that Nilpina is considered to be something known as a Lagerstätten, um, which is a wonderful German word. So now you've learned uh, an, an, an Adamutna word and a German word in this talk. So Lagerstätten is, um, it means fossil bonanza, uh, and it's an area of exceptional preservation. And there's a couple Lagerstätten spread out throughout the world. Um, La Brea Tar Pits is a really famous one over in LA. 
Um, the Green River Formation is another really well-known one. And if you've been to any rock shop in the United States, you've probably seen these fossil fish. Um, the Burgess Shale is, of course, another super famous one. And Lagerstein's are indicative of places where you either have an abundance or a high diversity or a high quality of preservation um, and also soft body preservation. And so Nilpina is one of these places, and it's because we have an abundance of in situ specimens. So in situ is, uh, it, it basically means in place. And what we have at Nilpina is the organisms are preserved in the exact locations where they lived and died. And so let's compare that to, say, the rest of the fossil record. So I have here a, a picture of some shell hash, courtesy of the Earth and Planetary Science Museum here at UCR. And what you see in this in this rock is you have a bits and pieces of all sorts of stuff. Like there's a bit of a trilobite, there's some shelled organism right here, some crinoids, some bryozoans, right? It's all mixed and mangled and jumbled up inside this rock, right? And this is called a time averaged um, piece of sediment, right? So that trilobite didn't necessarily live at the same time as that shell, right? They could have been living hundreds of years apart from each other, but were preserved in the same piece of rock as due to the nature of uh, preservation. But in the Ediacaran, in particular at Nilpina, we have in situ specimens. So what we have here are four um, aspidella, which uh, are, are holdfasts. So essentially think of like the root of a frondose-like organism that would have lived in the water column, right? And I actually did my master's thesis on aspidella, so I'm a big aspidella fan. Um, but what we know at Nilpina, because they're all in situ, is that these four aspidella lived at the same time in the same place, right? So we know that these four aspidella are in the exact same location as they would have been at the time of preservation, which allows us to view um, our specimens at Nilpina, and we have hundreds of thousands of individual specimens, not only as just individuals, but also as an entire ecosystem. And this allows us to really do some deep dives into understanding these organisms. And so for the remainder of my time, I, I really want to just get into some of the firsts um, that are present in the Ediacaran. Um, like I said, this is the beginning of macroscopic life of macroscopic ecosystems. So we're going to have the beginning of things that we take for granted. Um, so first and foremost, uh, we have mobility, right? Mobility is super important for modern organisms. We're mobile taxa. Um, probably a lot of the charismatic animals that you're used to thinking about are mobile. And mobility is important because it allows an organism to find new resources, so new food sources, uh, but also um, helps it find potential new mates, right? So mobility in general is a really good thing in the sense of like evolution and as a biological investment. And so one of the um, most well-known fossils at Nilpina and in the Ediacaran in general is this uh, a genus known as Dickinsonia. And Dickinsonia is this, it's sort of a, uh, it's an elliptical shaped organism. It also can be circular in shape. Uh, it, it has this dividing line in the middle and then is broken up into these little modules. And so work done by uh, my good friend, Scott Evans, who actually fun enough, just got hired at FSU. So he's now a Florida Seminole, uh, Florida State Seminole, which is great. Um, and he, uh, what he did his PhD work on was looking at these things called Dickinsonia footprints, which are essentially um, inverted Dickinsonias. And what he figured out was that these were actually the trace marks of a Dickinsonia moving across the surface. And the seafloor at this time, it wasn't sandy. So don't think of it as like, the beach at um, at Huntington, right? At Huntington Beach. This would have been um, covered, the seafloor would have been covered in this microbial mat. So think like pond scum. And what the Dickinsonias were doing was they would sort of sit on the surface and eat up all that pond scum and then kind of lift up and go to the next spot and eat some more. And so the footprints are actually just the uh, the areas where the Dickinsonia had been lying for some time and eating up that microbial mat. And at, at these days, we think that there are at least seven taxa in the Ediacaran that for sure moved. Um, another example would have be uh, Spragina, which is the state fossil of South Australia. 
And Spraginos are these beautiful little guys. Um, again, notice there's this uh, dividing midpoint. And they would have had this sort of um, maybe arrow-shaped uh, interior. Maybe that's not the best way to describe it. Dome-shaped interior. Um, and then modulars going around the side. Uh, so this is another mobile taxa that we have at Nilpena. Another thing that's really important um, in the modern is sexual reproduction, right? A lot of organisms reproduce sexually, and it's a really good way of producing mutations, which of course lead to uh, evolutionary change on the scale of millions of years, right? And so one of the, um, or the earliest example of sexual reproduction was found at Nilpena Ediacara National Park. It's this tubular fossil known as Phoenicia dorothea. Um, you can see my colleague here, Rachel Suprenet, who did her master's thesis on Phoenicia, uh, lovingly staring at this steel cast model of, of a Phoenicia dorothea, which we have here in the lab. Um, and these would have been these uh, sort of modulated tubes, which, um, which lived in these clusters. And by looking at these size clusters, so there would have been the small ones with the small ones, the big ones with the big ones, we were able to determine that these organisms were reproducing sexually. And later down the road, we've also found some other organisms that are likely reproducing sexually, which includes Triberchidium and Ruocanides. And that work was done by uh, another one of my colleagues, Chrissy Hall, who's now at uh, Lafayette College in Pennsylvania. And Triberchidium and Ruocanides are also really good segues into sort of a weird thing that, has, that occurred in the Ediacaran, which are triradial symmetry. So most organisms in the modern, including you and I, are bilaterally symmetrical. So our left side is even to our right side, right? It, it matches. Other taxa like, say, jellyfish or sea anemone are radially symmetrical. So they are circles in shape. But only in the Ediacaran do you have organisms that are triradial. So they have the same symmetry as like the Mercedes-Benz logo, right? So these three-point symmetry. And this is a really interesting uh, morphological trait that they would be an organism that was built up with three point symmetry. Some people have done some work looking into particularly Triberchidium, thinking that their shape helped them um, secure nutrients, so filter feed. But these form of symmetry, so Ruocanides and uh, Ruocanides and Triberchidium, they it goes away after the end of the Ediacaran. So once you get into the next geologic period, which is the Cambrian, we don't have this anymore. And so this is a really bizarre and sort of interesting trait that it only occurs in the Ediacaran. Another thing that the Ediacaran has a first of is complex macroscopic ecosystems. Though I've mentioned this a little bit um, in passing, but now I want to focus on it. And so when you look at, when you go to the beach today, right, let's say you get a snorkel, right, and you go into water, and you look at, say, a, an area of 10 square meters, certain places are going to be dominated by a couple taxa, right? Um, you might swim underwater, and there's just a bunch of seagrass and a couple snails and a starfish, right? And we have that in Ilpina, too. We have beds that are just dominated by, say, three taxa. But we also, when you go to the beach today, you find places that are covered in diversity, right? So I think the Great Barrier Reefs with tons of different, dozens of different taxa in a given area. And we're starting to see that at Nilpena. So this is, um, this is one of our premier fossil beds. This is called the Alice's Restaurant bed um, from the Arlo Guthrie song, Alice's Restaurant Massacre, where you can get anything you want at Alice's Restaurant. Um, and that, that's because on this bed, we have just a huge abundance of taxa. So each different colored dot is a different organism. Um, and as you can see, there's um, over 10 different species of organism living within a, a bedding surface that's maybe 10 square meters in area, all competing and living together in the same eco space, um, which is a really, really fantastic thing to find because that's how modern, or, uh, modern ecosystems are. There are tons of organisms living in the same place trying to get by, right? And looking at this image, something that I want you to just take note of is all these little green dots throughout the surface, right? And so that's this uh, fantastic little organism known as Adamborides janei. And so Adamborides is, uh, is this little raisin critter, right? Um, and it's being worked on by uh, another one of my colleagues, Heather McCandless. And Adamborides 
is the first example of a pelagic organism. So the pelagic organisms are anything that live between the seafloor and the surface of the ocean, right? And if you just take a moment just to, you know, think about it, that's a huge um, piece of real estate, right? Think about how much of the surface of the of the uh, of the Earth is between the seafloor and uh, the waves, right? That's a massive area, and most of the sea life that we know about today, fish and whales and sharks, live within this pelagic realm. And so Heather is doing incredible work right now, um, reconstructing atom varieties and um, using some interesting spatial analytical methods to determine that atom varieties was a pelagic organism. So one of these first organisms to venture off the seafloor and into the water column. So it's also named after uh, Sir David Attenborough, who came to Nilpena uh, before my time, uh, maybe 10 or so years ago, and, and actually made this fantastic documentary called First Life. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about the Ediacaran, you can check out that documentary. It's really quite good. The last thing I want to talk to you guys about is um, probably the most important fossil that we have at Nilpena. Uh, and that's because it is the earliest example of a bilaterian. And bilaterians are organisms with the bilateral symmetry, but also have a through gut, right? So basically an in-hole and an out-hole, if you will. Um, and we are bilaterians. Your dog is a bilaterian, your cat's bilaterian. A lot of, every mammal is a bilaterian, every reptile is a bilaterian, right? Um, this is an important thing to discover in the fossil record because, you know, one of the fundamental questions of science is where did we come from? And so for a long time, we had seen these little trace fossils, um, essentially feeding tracks through the microbial mat at Nilpena, and they were called helmichthoid ignites. Um, and due to the structure of this trace fossil, we knew the organism had to be a bilaterian, just because only a bilaterian can kind of move in that manner, right? And so... We also knew that it was it was going to be really, really, really tiny. Um, so my colleagues and my advisor, so my advisor, Mary Drozer, and uh, my colleague, Scott Evans, and Ian Hughes, and a couple other folks, they got this high-quality 3D scanner, so micro-millimeter 3D scanner. And we're looking at these tiny little imprints in the rock, like the size of a grain of rice. And we're able to determine that these little grain of rice imprints were actually organisms. Um and they named the organism Icaria ruridii. Icaria is the Adnamutna word for meeting place, and it's what they call um, this geologic feature known as Wilpina pound, which is visual, visible um, from Nilpena. And Waridii is the name from the Waridii Creek, which runs from the Flinders Ranges, which is a nearby mountain range, to Nilpena. Um, and it would have been this tiny little fella digging through the microbial map, um, but it's the oldest bilaterian, right? Which is a fantastic discovery um, because like I said, the majority of animals that you're familiar with are bilaterians and you're also a bilaterian, right? So this let us know that our, our, our earliest ancestors were here in the Ediacaran um, and were moving around. They might've been kind of tiny, but they were there and they're just trying to get by. Um, and so you might be thinking from this talk, like, wow, they've done so much work. like. The book is closed on Ediacaran. We, we know so much about these organisms. Um, but that's actually not entirely true. Um, the Ediacaran is a very new field in the, in the, the greater uh, community of paleontology. Um, dinosaur paleontologists like to say that they're going through uh, a renaissance, that they are re-looking into the dinosaur fossil record and using new techniques and methods to try to understand them. But in Ediacaran paleontology, we haven't even hit the golden age, right? We, we are still trying to understand fundamental things about these organisms. We don't know how most of, we don't know how most of them reproduce. We don't know how most of them consume nutrients. Um, we're finding new specimens all the time. In fact, literally last month, they discovered a new um, possible cnidarian um, from the UK. So we're constantly finding new material and we actually really need more people studying the Ediacaran and particularly people from diverse backgrounds who view the world differently than your run of the mill paleontologist from say an Ivy League school. We need regular folks looking at these specimens and coming up with fun new ideas about how they could have reproduced or fed or just lived their lives. 
And so, you know, we really need more folks to uh, consider paleontology as a career path. And I, I welcome all of you to shoot me emails or uh, swing by my office at UCR and, you know, ask me questions about it and, you know, get interested in, in this really fantastic subfield of paleontology. Um, and with that, I'd, I'd like to thank, uh, you know, the co-hosts here at uh, Fossil Fridays, but also uh, probably more importantly, thank my funding sources, um, the NASA Exobiology Program, uh, the American Museum of Natural History, Society of Sedimentary Geology, Paleontological Society, and the Geological Society of America. Additionally, thanking Ross and Jane Fogger and the folks at uh, the Department of Environment and Water in South Australia for allowing access at Nilpena. Again, acknowledging that the Adna uh, that Nilpena is Adna Mutna traditional lands, and also that um, the traditional landholders of UCR, where, like, to be perfectly frank, I do like ninety percent of my work. Um, and thanks, thank all the great folks who help out with field work, um, the museum staff here at UCR, and all the other grad students who helped me make this presentation. So thanks so much, and I'd love to answer any questions, comments, or concerns. I guess. <laughs> Okay, so stop sharing, right? Yeah, you can stop. Okay, okay so that? that's you can just I think just exit. Oh. Maybe? There you okay. go. Nice, nice. Cool. <laughs> okay, Phil, that is probably one of the coolest things anyone has ever shared on Fossil Fry Chat so far. Like, some of those animals are like they look alien, but that's actually like <laughs> the origins of our life on the planet Earth. That is just like mind blowing to me. Yeah, yeah, it's it's funny you say alien because um, one of our major funding sources is NASA, um, and it's we're funded by the NASA Exobiology Program specifically because these things are so bizarre um, that we can use them as uh, sort of ways of thinking about how life would develop on other planets. So alien is is maybe a good way of thinking about that. <laughs> That's so cool. So like the the stuff that you see at Nil Nilpina, right? Am Nilpina, right? yeah. Okay, yeah. Nilpina. That's kind of, is that sort of like what people are thinking we may f more likely to find out in space for like life, maybe like on Europa and things like that? Or is it more of like, we want to look at that and kind of understand how evolution could, you know, evolution could take in those different paths? Yeah, I think it, it's more so thinking about like how evolution develops on a planet. Like how do you build, how do you go from a planet with no life on it to it developing an ecosystem? And, you know, because famously, right, we only have an end value of one for life in the cosmos as for right now, um, we kind of got to use everything we got in the Ediacaran period and Nilpena in particular is a fantastic place to figure this out. Now, all of my colleagues do like to say if if, uh, if one of the rovers finds a Dickinsonia on Mars, um, our jobs are going to get a lot more interesting. <laughs> You're gonna but, be first in line for that spaceship, right? Like, oh, bro, shoot me up, man! I'm gonna go. <laughs> I'm so I'm be so stoked. We were we were joking about that when I went to see you last time. We were like asking mm -hmm. like my interns like who's ready to go to space, and like you and I were both like me. We're so ready, and the interns were like, no, that's scary. I'm like, no, send me right. Yeah, <laughs> you're like I'm ready to go. There there is like a hard line. Like I think a lot of like the either like you want to go or you're like absolutely not, dude. I'm staying here. Like I'm cool. <laughs> Phil, Phil is ready for that call from the Pentagon one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's my dream. Yeah, they call me up and they're like, we need you, Phil. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> Doesn't that sound cool? Like your job would be exopaleontologist, I guess? Yeah. Oh, I mean, the it would just be so much more interesting. Although the, the cost for field work would probably go up a little bit. So my grants would need to be a little bit bigger. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's a little bit, yeah. But I'm yeah, sure it'd be really cool. I'm sure if we can get millions of dollars for dinosaur research, we could find the money to look at ancient paleontology on, on other planets. So, yeah, bro. And you know what? You know, hot take dinosaurs, just birds, man. You know, like, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get I'm going to get a lot of. Oh, hate, sorry. But... I have to go. I have to update. I have to go update the uh, fossil Friday chats poster that says we've gone uh, this many episodes without insulting yeah, dinosaurs. Find a dinosaur. yeah. <laughs> We're terrible. But, uh, sorry, no. sorry, dinosaur paleontologist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, even from I'm a mammal paleontologist. I love all aspects of like yeah. paleontology and the story of life. But like, literally, the research you're doing is that almost the first chapter of like complex life and seeing those really weird experiments in evolution, like the the tri trilobate trabecidia. 
tribrachidium like yeah I should have triple, one right like here. three three symmetry is so and you just have one next to you that's yeah ridiculous. just chilling yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh wait i think i have a photo of that one when i was there anyway, yeah um it's just it's so cool these are these are life forms that we do not see anywhere on the planet earth today but they're some of the f first forms of it it's so cool yeah it, it, it's absolutely incredible um there's there's been some work um in the last 20 or so years um uh, particularly by i think it was dolph Seilacher, who's a, a pretty famous ichnologist so someone who studies trace fossils and um he wrote a paper where the ediacara biota were this uh were considered to be like a failed experiment in life right where we're testing out different things. Some things work, some things don't work, right? And so the tri, tri uh, the triradials would be an example of like something that didn't necessarily like work, right? Um, but something that I, I want to convey in my research um, is that these ecosystems aren't completely different from what we are today, right? Like things still live in space, like they still are competing and um, living in the same environment and eco space that normal organisms do, and they still need to somehow reproduce and somehow can uh, consume nutrients so it's different but it's also like similar uh so finding like where the similarities begin and the differences end is is a big part of my work <laughs> i think that's a great question for like a lot of yeah. folks because like ecosystems we're still discovering new things about modern ecosystems and the complexities of them so trying to de de decipher ecosystems from all the way at the ediacara i think it takes a bit of imagination too to be able to go that far back in time yeah yeah definitely a lot of uh careful consideration about what you're saying you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> all righty we've got some great questions from our listeners today so i'm going to go through we're going to try and get to as many as we can um uh this is a, a first one is actually from tyler and i think it's i think it's a question i think everybody uh, who's talked to a paleontologist has on their mind. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> what do fossils taste like? <laughs> ah, so um, <laughs> uh, right now, the ones at Nilpina would taste uh, probably pretty uh, dirty. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have a lot of dust at Nilpina, so it probably tastes like that. <laughs> um, these things would have been soft bodied. Um, I, they probably, to be perfectly frank, would have probably been a little gross, uh, a little slimy, I would imagine, right? Um, you know, that's, to that's total speculation. Do not, like, quote that. <laughs> but I assume that they would be... Major major yeah. newspaper, paleontologist <laughs> says the study, study tax would have been gross. Yeah, I mean, it would have been, like, slimy and, like, you know, soft-bodied. Um, I mean, recently I had jellyfish for the first time, so maybe it would kind of taste like that, uh, chewy. Um, but I, I, I can't say I, if I could, I would probably taste an Ediacaran fossil. But as of right now, I, I can't give you a hard answer uh, on what they would have tasted like um, when alive or, I guess, cooked. Uh. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess that uh, if we'd had a dinosaur paleontologist on, it would have been like, it would have tasted like yeah, chicken. Boring. Come on. <laughs> easy, easy. Easy, it easy. Tasted like jellyfish, Put some dear. sauce on it. <laughs> um, this next question is from Nicholas Tan. Um, in geology, what areas can you do a PhD in? Um, for example, uh, they mentioned the chemistry as organic chem, physical chem, biochem that you can deep dive in. So what's like, what's the equivalent for geology? Like how, like what kind of subjects can uh, somebody who's looking, like you mentioned, geology can be a really good career. Yeah. What's a, uh, what are some specialities? So, yeah, I mean, geology is, um, you know, you kind of name it and there's a specialty for it. Like there's, uh, for example, geochemistry. Um, both of my roommates are geochemists um, and they can be organic geochemists and inorganic geochemists, right? Um, you can do geophysics, which is super important for us down here mm -hmm. in California in the sense of earthquake mitigation, but also geophysics can be used um, to understanding like the lithosphere mantle boundary. Like one of my good friends, Beth, uh, does that work. Um, additionally, geophysical work can be done looking at, um, so in all, in all fairness, I used to actually want to be a geophysicist. Like that was my initial plan was to be a geophysicist. <laughs> um, so my sister's I did a geophysicist. No way. Really? Yeah. Oh, she dude. studies, um, uh, paleomagnetism. That's her thing. Yeah. 
Paleo Mag's another great thing. I did this one project where we we uh, we went to the what is it? The there's this big race track in uh, Charlotte where they do NASCAR and stuff. But we looked at how much G force the drag race, the drag car races were giving off, um, which was really kind of sweet. Um, so yeah, so geophysics. Um, you could do like obviously paleontology. There's structural geology. Um, you know, there's just <laughs> Yeah, sedimentology, right? So looking at <laughs> sediments, um, igneous Big metrology. Head. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, dude, yeah. Like, there's so, all there's, sorts of options. There's, there's so many fields because, like, you know, geology is kind of like the basis of all the life sciences in a way. Like, without the rocks, yeah. the rocks like determine like the type of life, the type of even weather and things like that, um, the surface processes. So wherever you can think of, there's so many elements of life and beyond that of of focus within geology. So there's so many fields you can focus in. When we go to conferences, yeah. our geology conferences are huge because there are tons of different like fields. And if you try to go to the poster sessions, you're gonna need like marathon shoes because you're gonna yeah. have to go through aisles and aisles of posters. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's a super diverse field. Um, and also just for all the parents out there, um, PhDs in geology are usually fully funded and you get a you get a stipend, so uh, there's no debt being incurred, which is super nice. So that's what we I, like to hear. I gotta get me one of those. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm too old now. Anyway, I'm oh, never too old. To, never too old to to follow your dreams. I have a corgi at home. I have to take care of. It's that's, that's a lot of work. That's now. true. That's true. Um, let's see. This is another good. Um, this is another good question from Nicholas. When there is a high diversity in um, one portion of the rock um, and they've never been seen before, what are some of the strategies paleontologists use to analyze and reconstruct those animals? They said they were thinking of early paleontologists that found like a high variety of animals in one place and had to reconstruct them. Like how, how do we as paleontologists reconstruct these environments? Yeah. So, you know, in the after the Ediacaran, right, so from the Cambrian onwards, um, it's a little bit more uh complicated because you have that time averaging right so you have this sort of mixing up of of material but in the ediacaran um we have essentially the whole seafloor is preserved right so think that you essentially take a picture of the seafloor so not only do we have you know these 10 let's say 10 different species scattered on the seafloor but we know exactly where they're living at least at the time of death um and so one of the things that i can do with my research is i look at okay, is taxa A's location being affected by any of the other taxa on a surface, right? Are all the trypercidiums avoiding, you know, the Dickinsonia, right? Or the Dickinsonia, I guess, avoiding the trypercidium because they're mobile, right? And um, how are they responding to say, like the microbial mat? Is there differences in the microbial mat um, and in relation to say the taxa on that surface? Um, so starting to think about things in a spatial context and then just also just straight up diversity analysis, right? Like how many of X taxa are there on the surface compared to every other taxa, right? Is this considered to be like a, a healthy ecosystem, like a healthy and diverse ecosystem, or is it actually just dominated by like one species? Like we have bedding surfaces that are literally just covered in Phoenicia, like thousands of Phoenicia and hundreds of Aspidella. And that's the only thing on a bedding surface. So, and then we have beds like ARB, which are like really, really kooky and like diverse, right? So it kind of varies. Um, if we could take a step back really quick, Phil, like mm. before you even get to the high diversity part, like how do you even see these, these trace fossils? Like these are not like the actual bones of or whatever of the organism. They're just these traces of these flat, weird looking creatures yeah. that like, how do you how do you spot them and how do you determine that this was once an organism and not like a uh, I don't know like a, a raindrop trace or you know um, like a ripple mark or something like how do you see that? Yeah. So um, that's something that uh, my my group takes a lot of a lot of pride in is uh, we are very very cautious and careful about uh, describing new taxa. So. There's some things that, you know, like Dickinsonia and Aspidella, like we've known about them for, you know, 50 plus years. So we kind of know what they look like. Um, but for new stuff, 
it's consistent morphological similarities in multiple specimens. Um, you know, we don't like to name a new taxa unless we have at least 10 individuals of that, of that species, right. To make sure that this morphological characteristic is consistent. Right. Um, you know, when it comes to then like, uh, how they're being preserved, I guess is sort of a side part is these would have been like storm events. So they would have smothered the organism. And because you have this nice microbial mat surface, um, it would have helped stabilize the organisms and keep them in place. And that's sort of the, uh, the preservational mechanism to keeping them preserved in situ. Um, but yeah, for naming species, we're very, very cautious. And we look at, we look at a lot of these things before we're like, this is in fact, like something that was alive and not just like some weird thing. Right. And are you spending like hours in the Australian outback, just like laying down on the, on the thing, like looking for like that shadow? Is that, is that what you're doing when you're out there? <laughs> so, um, so lighting is super important. And so there's, um, there's good lighting in the mornings and in the afternoons because it needs low lighting. So definitely during those times, it is a lot of like, ooh, what is this? What is this? But we log every single one of these fossil surfaces um, on a centimeter scale. Uh, so we go about and we find all these things. We take macro lens images of them. Um, we, 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 take a, we spend a lot of time just making sure we know everything that we have on the bedding surfaces. And, you know, we're always finding new stuff. Like even on beds that we excavated 20 years ago, like, you know, you, you're you're uh, logging an area that's maybe 20 square meters, you're probably, you might miss something, right? Like it's very possible that you miss something. And so we're always sort of like, oh, there's actually a spragina on this bed. Like who would have known? <laughs> so you're, re you're ready when you have to go to Mars so. and you have to look for things on that on that surface out there. You're ready to go. Yeah. yeah. Dude, I'll walk around. I'll look at every surface. You know, I'll be, I'll be thorough. Paleontology <laughs> version of the Martian. Yeah, I exactly. Just if, if I mean, I would too. Phil, yeah. If Phil were the main character too, I would watch that real right away. That would be great. <laughs> the the problem is I'd I'd like starve to death though, because I, I can never grow potatoes <laughs> like you did. Like I would they'd be like, you need to grow the potatoes, and I'm like, nah, fam. I'm just, I'm done. I'm just, like I, I'm the worst at growing plants. I cannot grow anything. So. Oh man. All righty. Um here's a good uh good another good question by um Tyler, um, what sort of fossils do you suppose humans will leave behind millions of years from now? Yeah, that's um, that's an interesting thing. I think there was the new GSA Today was talking about that. They uh, or there was something I saw, and it was like um, the index fossil for like uh, the Anthropocene was like it was like a hand with like a ring on it. Yeah, uh, I literally like have ring. that right here. <laughs> Yeah, it's, oh, do it's you? nuclear winter and then throw <laughs> yeah. the scene. And like, that's what they're saying was the. Yeah. Oh, dude, he has the actual thing. Yeah. yeah. It's like hey. a, a, a human hand with like a ring on it. Oh, whoa. Um, but and it, yeah. It's the, the index fossil for major nuclear war. Yeah. Which is uh, a super, super fun topic. <laughs> <laughs> so cheery. Uh, yeah. Um. But, you know, the, the fossil record for Homo sapiens is going to be interesting. Um, you know, like I said, the, the place where actually the majority of the fossil specimens are from is actually shallow marine environments, um, a place where humans don't actually live. Um, so um, it, it would be, I mean, there, there would probably be, it, it's also depending on how far back we're looking, right? The fossil record for Homo sapiens 20 million years from now is definitely going to be better than the fossil record for Homo sapiens half a billion years from now, right? Um, so it's, you know, it might be an occasional bone, uh, maybe some of our structures, but uh, yes, it, it's definitely something that you can spend a lot of time speculating and thinking about. Uh, I mean, what, what do y'all think? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just hoping my Facebook profile from high school doesn't survive to them. That's the one thing I don't want. Well, hey, none of our MySpace profiles uh, made it. So there's still hope. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We, we have a, we have a question in one of our undergraduate classes and it's like, uh, if you were a fossil, like where would you want to be preserved? And this Ooh. one person, he wrote like, uh, I wouldn't actually want to be preserved. Uh, cause I'm afraid they would like make me a different species. And they're like, Oh man, that's, like, <laughs> that's a call nah, man, nah. that's, oh. <laughs> 
Yeah. It's like, nah, dude, I'm normal. I'm just, I'm a normal homo sapien. Don't like, <laughs> I did something different. You know, like knowing us probably like, it's sad to say, but you know, our late, you know, the, the, what is it for them? For the Anthropocene sometimes they say yeah. it's like that start of the industrial revolution once you start to see that that like ash layer it's I really don't want to say it but I feel like for future like unfortunately our trash is going to be like this huge yeah. layer in mm -hmm. in in the story of life for our 100%. chapter and that's you know that's a whole other conversation to be had but like I'm afraid that's what's going to be our that's going to be like our our ash layer is that yeah our trace fossils are going to be off the chain. Oh, God. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, so cheery. Yeah. So lovely. <laughs> um, let's see. We've got a lot of good questions, so I'm trying to get through as many as we can. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is from a uh, Seahawks fan. Uh, Seahawks. Which, fo I know. <laughs> which fossil is one that you're most proud of having found yourself? Um. So, funny enough, uh, that's not actually my part of the – uh team i don't i'm not in the excavate i'm not in like the discovery oh, mm -hmm. part of it we have different people who do different stuff um i did find one time not at nopina but i did find a uh, a fossilized dolphin uh poop um oh which was which was pretty lit uh that's so fun. that's probably my favorite thing that i have in my <laughs> personal collection <laughs> that's, um, a, that's a good point too also that you just yeah. made that like not every single paleontologist goes out and digs and is like the person who finds the fossils. Like I, I've been very open about the fact that like when we go out digging, I'm like, please put me in a quarry. I can't see anything. I can't find things. That's not where my skill set lies. Yeah. Yeah. So at Nopina, you know, um, doing that excavation that you're moving piece. I mean, they're like giant jigsaw puzzles, right? These are the, like three dimensional jigsaw puzzles. So um, the, the folks who do the excavating have been doing this for like years and they're specialists. They know what they're doing. They're pros. Um, and so it's, it's better for the fossils that, that those guys work on it. Um, and then I do more of like the logging. I also do, um, like 3d modeling of all the bedding surfaces. So more on the side of, um, seeing what we have and collecting the data so that, you know, it's preserved for posterity. Um, <clears throat> I yeah, the, really the cool. dolphin poop. <laughs> <laughs> One, dolphin poop, dolphin coprolite's cool as a marine mammal yeah. paleontologist, so mm -hmm. I'm here for it. But, like, two, I think that's cool the way you sh – you're, you're sharing kind of, like, how modern fieldwork almost looks. Like, a lot of folks, yeah. their perception of fieldwork comes from, like, Jurassic Park and even Jurassic World from the last movie, yeah. which I have I have opinions on, what I'm not going to get into today. <laughs> um, but but it's, it's, like, you know, like, when you're in the field, there's different jobs for people. And – modern yeah. like you said you're doing 3d modeling out there and that's that's kind of another aspect of it when we're preserving these sites of all the fossils in situ um that's important data as well so we're not out there like brushing away sand to expose like whole skeletons there are so many different jobs out there for how paleontology is run today i mean like i'm thinking about like even if you go out to if you're in los angeles and you go to the tar pits you know their their whole excavation site there's so many different things that are done out there and it's not just someone with a brush right there's so many different ways that modern paleo field work is done today there's so much there's a hardcore digital aspect to it now mm -hmm. yeah yeah and and not and that's just like the field element of it i mean there's so much paleontology that just needs to be done looking at museum specimens and just oh yeah like i mean you don't have to. You don't have to be like Bear Grylls to be a paleontologist. You, <laughs> I am the furthest thing from that. Yeah. I will tell you, and I am a paleontologist. Like when I was in the field, I I was one. I was the one guy who was like fixing my hair in the morning. I was like, yeah. Even though I'm going to be out in the field, I'm like, I'm going to look nice for me. That's all that matters. Yeah. yeah. yeah you got to have the drip. You know. <laughs> totally valid. I just take selfies. I want to have a nice haircut when I'm in the field. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Um, this is another question from Nicholas. How do you know that the imprints that you're finding are from organisms? How do you, uh, so, you know, how do you tell that it's not like a, a rock or another object that made that imprint? Yeah. So uh, great question, Nicholas. Um, so one, one of the things that we do, like I said, was that morphological repetition, right? So 
these things are having, like, let's say, um, let's say this Rugo Canides right here, right? So this Rugo Canides, this has a very distinct shape to it. It's different. It's clearly different from the rest of the rock. So this is actually like from Milpina, this rock. So this is, this is what they look like. Um, so um, it's, it's clearly different from the rest of the surrounding sediment, right? So one of the great things about being a homo sapien, Nicholas, is that you and I and everyone here um, is really good at pattern recognition. So we're very, very inherently good at seeing like this looks a lot different than this. And then so we see if this shape repeats in other parts of like our excavation sites, right? So is it, are we finding it on tons of different rocks? And after we find about 10 specimens, we're being we're able to say okay this is definitely an organism of some kind this is a fossil of some kind and then once we know that's an organism then the hard part comes up because then you got to figure out okay how did this thing actually live though like it wasn't you can't just be like ah this is this is an animal <laughs> done so like, that's it you go have home to, like, we're done here yeah we need to understand like how it fits in the tree of life if it fits in the tree of life which is a problem in the ediacaran which sometimes stuff doesn't fit in like our predetermined categories um and then you know can we determine if if it uh if it moved um and how we do that is looking for trace fossils so looking for evidence of it either consuming microbial mat um if it digging the sort of horizontal traces um or it being sort of out of place like adam varieties has um it's randomly distributed on a, on a surface it has no relation spatially to any other object. Um, and so that combined with other morphological traits, let's just know, okay, it's it's not, it's definitely wasn't like living. It was definitely either mobile or pelagic. Like you don't have that distribution for most uh, most sessile organisms. So, so yeah, great, uh, great question, Nicholas. <laughs> um, this is a question um, from, I'm sorry. Uh, SV is Anderbeck. And it's actually, I think it's a really good question because it's um it's about the uh mm -hmm. checkerboard patterned card that you had in uh some of your slides. What is that? Yeah, so that's a uh that's a scale card. Um so each one of those little black and white boxes is uh one centimeter. Um and so that's uh that's important because uh, you want to know how big something is when you take the picture home, right? So we can't, with the exception of certain specimens that we have on loan, um, we can't bring back like 300 square meters of like Australia, right? Like the Australian government wouldn't be <laughs> stoked about that. So we, we need to make sure that our images are scaled, right? And so we know how big, like this Spragina that is like, uh, five centimeters long or whatever. Um, so by having that scale card, we're then able to scale the whole or organism and look at it in a sense of, of size. Um, so that's, that's what those little things were. Uh, great question though. Yeah. I always car uh, carry, I've got a scale car, uh, scale bar in my wallet all the time. It's, it's helpful even outside of paleontology. Yeah. Anytime I'm taking a picture and I want to know how big something actually is, it's great. It's a great reference point. It is. They're fantastic. Although recently I've been getting really using my AirPods as a, as a scale just to like flex. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to do that now too. I was like, I have, these are my AirPod Pros Nerds. for scale. Yeah. Nerds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. It's the actual size of the AirPod, AirPod Pros. Cause guess what? I don't own yeah. those. Well, ah. you get on our level. Okay. Well, okay, guys. Goodness, I'm being outnumbered here. Really, uh, uh, Brittany. Really quick, can we do the shout out that Myrene gave? Yeah, that was so cute. Okay, so uh, Myrene uh, Belisi, uh, curator, Elf uh, FFC alum, just put this um, uh, comment on the YouTube. Not a question, but one of my colleagues is such a fan of the Diocran that they named their child uh, Ediacara, nicknamed Edie. And thank you for sharing the Whoa. original meaning of the name. Yes, yeah. no, of course. Yeah, that's um, so cute. Yeah, this is so one awesome. of the preparators at the tar pits. So um, he named his daughter Edie, Edie Acra. So it's a combination of the first and middle name. So it becomes Edie Acara. And when I found that out, I was like, you nerd. This is the 
coolest thing you've ever you've ever said to me and i love this so so much that's such a sick name yeah although like i do sort of feel bad for the child's teachers who have to uh... well (laughs) that's why they come that's why it's a combining they can yeah yeah, they can hide the the nerdiness in the name just be eating Edie. But, no, oh, that so that's so baller, dude. I'm so jealous. Um, <laughs> like, that's that's really sick. Uh, oh, well, man. that's a great way to end the show. So, okay. Phil, one of the last questions we always ask everybody is, what is one piece of advice you would give to a future paleontologist, somebody who might be interested in paleontology, or even your field, or maybe even exobiology, exopaleontology? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I would say, um, you know, stay, uh, be curious, obviously, but also be willing to get out of your comfort zone. Like I moved across the continent um, to come to graduate school and pursue a field that I had. Like I never took a paleontology class in undergrad. So like I did my, my thesis work, but I had no like background or proper training. So just be willing to get out there and like move and, you know, kind of really get out of your comfort zone is what I would, is the piece of advice I would say. And, and don't be like locked on one specific field. Like, you know, if you, if you think you can be good at something um, or you're interested in something, uh, just do it and just see what happens. Like, you know, YOLO. Like. <laughs> okay. I'm cutting off the, I'm cutting the right now. I'm cutting the We're done here. Oh, oh. <laughs> Okay. Well, so that does it for this episode. Thank you so much, Phil, for joining us. That was really, really cool. We've learned some really, really cool stuff. Um, if folks want to get a hold of you, kind of ask you questions or learn more about your research, what's the best place for them to go? Um, probably check out my Twitter, uh, PC Bowen, um, or I guess shoot me in an email at uh, pbowen001 at ucr.edu. Um, yeah, it's probably the best two places that I, those are like the two things I always have up. So Cool. Well, thank you so much. And thank you so much to everybody for tuning in today. As always, if you like this program and want to support programs like it at the ALF Museum and the Western Science Center, you can find links on how to do that in the description below. And as always, make sure you like and subscribe for more stories from the world of paleontology. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thanks.